Hello, welcome, 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 welcome. So have you ever seen uh, those videos, usually, you know, by British YouTubers, myself included in the past, unfortunately, uh, but the likes of the lovely uh, Joel and Leah, where they talk about British words that get corrupted in America or, or you know, Americans um, make up their own terminology or the, there's weird spelling differences that Brits don't understand, those kind of videos, right? Obviously, they're great for traffic and, and all of that. And I think that's uh, partly the reason that we do them or that I did them. I, I've I've kind of tried to cease because I want to take a look more at the history of some of the uh, sort of language differences between Britain and America. And this video is very much designed to kind of defend American English against um, attacks. I mean, I don't want to, you know, pin attacks like that on uh, Joel and Leah and, and those kind. They are being very lighthearted when they do it and, and that should be appreciated. But there are people, and I've seen this in YouTube comments, who get very passionate about how American English is is ruining English. In fact, even the term American English is something that causes much anger among people uh, that are purists uh, when it comes to the, sort of the British variety of English. To me, that's insane. And I say that as somebody who has a degree in English, somebody who has studied uh, different varieties of English, including Canadian English, Australian English, my own uh, British slash English English, and of course American English. There are numerous avenues by which I want to defend American English, so let's get started. Whenever Brits sort of, you know, level criticism at the, the word choices of Americans, a lot of the time they're not aware that some of those very words that they're poking fun at were in fact coined by the British. Of course, I've talked about it extensively on my channel, but the word soccer is a fine example of that. So the word soccer was coined um, in Britain, in England, no less, at Oxford University, they believe, um, possibly by the England captain, the England football captain at the time. And it, it came from a trend of coining words out of, out of long words and just adding ER on the end. In the case of soccer, it comes from the word association, as in association football. They took the, the, the letters SOC from that and coined soccer. It's a good job, of course, they didn't take the first three letters of association and, and make the word that way. That would have been an entirely different sport. But anyway, um, so it, uh, it was coined. We used it uh, right through the 19th century and, you know, it made its way to the United States. It made its way to Australia, which, it, of course, it's still there, used there today. So America, uh, by no means the only English-speaking country to use soccer. And then there was a divergence. There was a divergence between football and rugby football, of course, which were sports that kind of emerged at the same time in terms of the, the professional associations of them. And so to distinguish uh, the two, you know, they had rugby and then in England they had they had football. Well, here in America, that distinction was never really made because, well, there's a huge ocean in the way. And rugby never took off uh, here in the form of rugby. In fact, it evolved into what Americans know today as American football. And that's why uh, that sport retains the word football. Uh, speaking, though, of words that sort of originated in British universities in the 19th century, no less, uh, the word brunch, right? I always thought definitely an American word. Um, it's not necessarily a word that, uh, you know, draws criticism uh, from people. It's a nice enough word because, of course, it en encapsulates uh, the, the, the quaffing of food. Do you quaff food or do you drink it? I don't know. Uh, you don't drink food uh, unless it's soup. Brunch uh, was... The, it was coined in, in English universities by students in, in the 19th century, just to, obviously with the same meaning that's uh, intended to this very day. But one thing that should be pointed out is that they went back and forth over, over brunch and blunch. Imagine if blunch had won out over brunch. It sounds a bit murderous. You know, it's it's a bit close to bludgeon. That's probably why it uh, went by the wayside. But again, another example of a word that was coined by the British that, um, you know, we often perceive to be an American English word. The same, I discovered, weirdly, is true of the word cooties, right? Do you know the word cooties? It's, it's sort of like the British equivalent of lurgy. It's a fictional uh, childhood disease. This was coined by British soldiers to mean lice, essentially, actual lice. The um, meaning evolved over time, but it really didn't take off in the United States as such until about the 1950s when um, the British soldiers and American soldiers interacted with each other in the South Pacific. And at that time, the Americans took it back and it um, it took off. You could say that the British gave the Americans cooties. And then finally, uh, I mean, there are plenty more words, but I just want to finish on this one because 
you know, I, I always think of this word as uniquely American, and that word is gasoline. Uh, obviously, in the United Kingdom, we say uh, petrol, usually to mean that very same thing. But uh, gasoline, again, it was a, a British coinage uh, by a um, businessman uh, from the 19th century, again, uh, called John Cassell. Okay, and uh, from his name, a corrupted version of his name, ended up spelling gasoline, gasoline, until it was adopted over here, but then petrol won out eventually. Uh, so those are just some examples, just some. There are plenty more of supposedly American English words that were coined by the British. So we should be a little more relaxed, I think, when it comes to poking fun, uh, because we were the people that originated it. So that's right. So without even knowing it, you're probably using American derived words every single day. In fact, I can absolutely guarantee you are because uh, one of those words is hello. I mean, who doesn't say hello on any given day? The word hello came out of the 19th century. Now, of course, there'd been words similar to this, like hello and hallo uh, that existed previously. The word that we know today and the word spelled the way it is, H-E-L-L-O, uh, absolutely came out of the United States. It's believed that um, it was a word used by by frontiersmen as they uh, they moved out west uh, in the 19th century. But it really took off, not just in the United States, but of course around the English-speaking world, with the invention of uh, one very important uh, technological device, and that's the telephone. Uh, when the telephone came about um, through Alexander Graham Bell, of course. Well, I say of course, there are obviously different theories as to who did invent the telephone, but he's widely credited with it. But the word hello uh, won out as the sort of preferred greeting when one would answer the phone. Um, he wanted, Alexander Graham Bell wanted, ahoy, can you imagine that? If we'd be saying, uh, ahoy, you want to meet for blanche? That would be very strange. But another common word that uh, came out of the United States, uh, in fact, I think I've used it in this very video about 12 times, is the word okay. Strangely enough, you know, you'd think that uh, this word had been around for, for millennia, but no, uh, the word okay, again, emerged in 19th century United States, believed to have been in the Boston slash New York air area. It came from an acronym for all correct all correct, but they, for some reason, decided to spell all with an O and correct with a K instead of a C, which is one of those quirks. The 19th century in the United States, by the way, if you're ever interested, has a lot of quirks to it, um, which we may touch on uh, again here in just a moment. Uh, and the word was then popularized, actually, through the presidential campaign of Martin Van Buren. It was you know, put across a lot of his uh, uh, campaign literature because of uh, where he was from. He was from a, a place called Kinderhook, and he was given the, the nickname Old Kinderhook. So they abbreviated it to OK. He eventually lost that presidential campaign, but nonetheless, the word did stick and it, uh, you know, became a big part of the English language. Speaking of presidents, in fact, Thomas Jefferson, widely credited with coining the word belittle. And at the beginning of the 20th century, the word hangover came into use. And believe it or not, it came into use in the United States. And I've often said, you know, if it had waited 20 years, we might not have had that word because the United States uh, went into the Prohibition era and, you know, drinking or the sale of alcohol was banned. Um, so imagine, British people, a world without the word hangover. That's one I use every day. So I'm not every day. I'm not an alcoholic. You know, and there are some sort of characteristics of American coinages that are quite interesting. For, for instance, it turns out that America has coined an oddly high number of, uh, of words that feature consecutive instances of the letter Z, or Z, depending on how you pronounce that, you know, such as uh, jazz, snazzy, fizzle, pizzazz. Uh, however, uh, England takes credit for coining drizzle because of course it does. But there are other bizarre characteristics and we'll get onto those in just a moment. <laughs> Yes, so America is replete with words, and when I say words, I mean fantastic words that uh, are pretty much unique to the United States. So I talked about, you know, words there that uh, contain consecutive instances of the letter Z slash Z. Same with the letter O, such as wang doodle, look that one up, that's amazing, boondoggle, doohickey, and do wop, right? All the more insane then that the British... Uh, coined cooties. And that's not where it ends. Randomly, you've got a bunch of words, American words, that are unique to America that um, uh, happen to begin with the letter C, I've noticed. And, uh, you know, those are copacetic, uh, uh, conniption, uh, catacorner, or catty corner, or kitty corner. There's many variants on, on that particular phrase. Um, Cattywampus. Is that not the greatest word you've ever heard? If it isn't, then there's something entirely wrong with you. So just a brief selection there of American English words that are more 
or less unique to American English that for me are are phenomenal and should um, should go the other way, should cross the ocean and be used in Britain um, because a lot of them sound like they are British. Recently, I found out that the word uh, bumbershoot uh, to mean umbrella, which uh, had been widely assumed by by the Americans actually to have been a word of British origin, it's a word we we barely know in in Britain. Um, in fact, was coined in the United States. We of course in in the UK say brolly. So um, either way, either way, umbrella has on either side of the pond uh, a nice slang term to describe it. Yes, yeah, so America draws a lot of ire for its its spelling differences, you know, for uh, incorporating an ER spelling on center instead of RE. Uh, but what should be noted is that uh, we, the British, did exactly the same thing um, with words like November and October that came from Old French that uh, were previously spelled RE. Um, and we just changed that um, after it came in. The word aluminum versus aluminium is an interesting one. You know, it's often, often said that, uh, oh, Americans don't know how to spell because they changed the spelling uh, to a, something admittedly rather simple, but in fact it wasn't the Americans. It was Sir Humphrey Davy, an English chemist, um, who coined the initial spelling. And then others outside of his control wanted to change it to aluminium, and that kind of stuck in England, but it, it, it made it over to America as aluminum, and may have been reinforced there later on by a typo, uh, somebody trying to spell aluminium. But in fact, the word aluminium was uh, used stateside, I think, until about the 1920s when um, aluminium eventually won out. But aluminium, of course, is very much accepted by the, the main science body. To criticise it is still, it's a very strange thing, especially since we came up with that spelling. <laughs> Once again, I could talk about pronunciations until the cows come home, and, and the cows are coming home. That's really weird. Get back! Get back in the shed! Yep. Uh, pronunciation differences are an interesting thing, you know, but they have a historical um, reason behind them in many cases. So let's take the uh, the traditional American pronunciation of the word herb, right? They, they take off the H, um, and that's because historically we all did in the English-speaking world. Um, the word herb was, well, it came from Old French again, um, and it came from Old French without an H even on the word. It was spelled E-R-B-E. And uh, so everybody was spelling it that way. During the 19th century, though, there was a trend in England, not in the United States, toward seeing age dropping as a kind of linguistic faux pas. It, it sort of put you at a lower status, uh, class status, if you were the kind who dropped it. That's why in My Fair Lady, they make such a big thing over the fact that Eliza Doolittle drops her H's, whereas Henry Higgins, who I think is purposely called that, very much pronounces his age, goes to the point of emphasizing it in the song when he says that hurricanes hardly happen. This was very much to denote a class divide, and so many people in the United Kingdom in the 19th century and 20th century, when that is set, started to ensure that they pronounced their H's, but it wasn't foolproof, and in fact you can see evidence of that today because we still, in England and of course in the United States of America, drop the H on words like our and honour, again words that came from French. So I think to be critical of the American pronunciation of herb, or to be critical of any of the things that I've uh, listed in this video, is somewhat hypocritical. See what I did there? I'll drop the H where it shouldn't be. Hi, thanks for joining me for day six of Vlogmas. Uh, I had uh, planned, I think, to keep these videos short, so this was a bit uh, of a departure from expectation. Uh, hope you enjoyed it, though, nonetheless, and uh, if you did, and if you have any sort of uh, thoughts of your own on American English and the power that it has had over the English-speaking world, let me know in the comments below. Thank you, as ever, to our wonderful patrons, without whom these videos wouldn't be possible. Vlogmas certainly wouldn't be possible, so we thank you eternally uh, for your support during this time. And if you would like to support us in this way, you can do so at patreon.com slash lost in the pond. And anyone who has an interest in the kind of things we talked about today might want to check out my distant words playlist. So click on that bloody link there and go to my distant words playlist. And if you're new to the channel, why not hit my stupid little face right there and punch me on the bell? Just click, just click the bell. It'll be fine.